uh, for those who are just joining us, um, we have James and Ruby talking about audiobooks and how to make them stand out. So I believe this is a subject close to my heart right at the moment because I'm just now getting into the audio. So yeah, James and Ruby, please take it on. Start. Absolutely. Go ahead. I would I like do to. Do a, I would like mm -hmm. to do a real quick introduction. Um, okay. Go Jack here. Um, Hi, Jack. These these two people are my friends and my partners from Los Angeles. Aww. James has done voiceover work for several of my fiction works, uh, like a novella, and most recently, uh, voiceover work on Wild Blue Yonder, which Ruby is mastering and production producing into a brand new, complete audiobook for Audible. And uh, Ruby is also our, our, our uh, audio arts barista on Fictional Cafe. She's been with me for four years now, and it's just a terrific, terrific person to work with. And James has a voice as mellow as Liberace's. I love, <laughs> love them both. Oh, oh, don't don't lie to them right before I have to speak for an hour. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> well, first of all, James, she's on. First of all, you don't have to speak for an hour. You just take it for as long as it is. Yeah, let I'll... Ruby yeah. talk a little bit. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. I do appreciate it, and also thank you so much for inviting me back here again because I was here in 2018. I don't know if you remembered the speech I gave then, but we've updated it because the cool thing about audiobooks is they're getting more and more popular, which I noticed some of you weren't noticing. But first off, to give a little insight, Jack gave it as well. Um, I am the founder and producer and editor and all around great and powerful leader of Faux Fiction Audio. I've been doing it for about five years now, give or take. There's about 20 voice actors, editors, just various towns. We've got spread out through the Los Angeles and Portland, Oregon area. And it's just really great because even if we weren't in the middle of COVID right now, it is so simple to just reach out to those people and say, hey, I've got a person over here who's got a book they want to do and can just send audio back and forth, easy peasy, which makes it really, really um convenient on everyone's behalf and they can also do it on the free time which is also thank goodness um in the past five years we have done almost we have done so many audiobooks i mean we started off with mickey mckinney which was about five uh no sorry 12 audio productions and we did a lot of work for jack so we've got wild blue yonder um adventures of sean mcbrady uh, we're working on, oh, we're working on Wild Blue Yonder now, but we just finished Anarchy and that was a lot of fun. So we've done a lot of great work. Thank you again to Jack on that. Um, he was my first client and he's still my favorite client, actually, <laughs> just consistently giving us audiobooks that are so much fun to do and to bring to life in so many ways. Um, James, I know you want to talk about yourself for a little bit, so why don't you go do that? I'm going to throw the dog outside because she's a little noisy right now. <laughs> so go. Okie dokie. Uh, uh, for anyone who doesn't know me, uh, my name is James Delhauer. Uh, I predominantly work as a video and audio engineer and workflow specialist for film and television. Um, Ruby kindly put my uh, some of my clients on the screen. I've worked for Netflix and Marvel. Uh, most recently, I was working for the Quibi Network, which some of you may have heard. Um, died an untimely death just a couple of weeks ago so that was a little bit of an upset but um most prevalent to this uh i'm a member of iatsi 695 which is hollywood's premier sound and video local uh when when it comes time for someone to go out on set and do on-set recording and uh sound mixing work uh they call us uh and so i've been a part of that for the last six years or so and um yeah, that's kind of what brought me into this. That's kind of why Ruby reached out and asked, uh, hey, can you help me with some of my projects? And I've been working with audiobooks and specifically with Faux Fiction Audio and with Jack uh, for the last five or six years now. God, I really wouldn't be where I am right now if you weren't there, James, swear to God. Oh, yay, it's my turn. Uh, <laughs> so I, I snuck into the chat a little bit earlier and I know some people were saying, wow, audiobooks have really come into their own they're really increasing well. I have some actual formal statistics. So 
if you remember back in 2018, there were 50,000 audiobooks being produced per year. In 2019, as you see, the numbers have risen to 60,000. We are not sure how many were produced in 2020. However, audiobook sales have generated $1.2 billion in revenue annually. That is pretty darn impressive. Ebook sales coming in second at 983 million. So on one hand, it's a great business to break yourself into because everybody's looking for audiobooks, especially right now when we're all kind of locked into our houses and we need something to do to keep from going crazy with boredom. However, it is also an extremely saturated market. So you need to find ways to make your stories stand out in the sea of titles and covers. How are we going to do that? Well, um, got a couple ideas for you guys. See how you like them. First of all, I would like to share a quote with you. Uh, this is from my friend Stephanie Arnold. She told me um, how she was able to get her successful best-selling uh, book done was she said, 5% of my work went into writing. 95% of it went into marketing. Your book is no doubt fantastic, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. James is gonna talk a little bit about how you might want to make yourself stand out. Go for it, James. So when it comes to audiobook presentations, um, sorry, thank you, Ruby. The, let's not forget that. Um, when it comes to audiobook presentations, uh, you're dealing with a realm of technical issues that simply don't exist when you're dealing with print. Uh, something that a professor of mine in college said and continues to be true uh, to this day is that an audience can forgive bad visuals. If you're watching a movie, uh, they can forgive bad visual effects. They can forgive out of focus shots. They can forgive things that aren't well shot, but they cannot forgive bad sound. That is something that human beings are psychologically not equipped to do. Um, mostly because it'll give them a headache and no one wants to have their escapism hurt them. When you're dealing with an audiobook, sound is all you have. That is 100% true across the board. Um, of the 50 to 60,000 audiobooks that are published each year, many of them uh, don't have a problem with this, but a surprisingly large number of them do. A surprisingly large number of them have various sound issues and great on the ear and on the psyche and will almost disqualify them from being purchased right away. So although it seems obvious, um, making sure that your audio is of professional and sufficient quality is one of the most important things that you can do. Um, a well-made audio adaptation of a bad book or a bad story is always going to sell better than a poorly made production of the most magnificent Shakespearean piece of art that someone has put to paper. Um, when it comes, I'm sorry. Sorry, you want the next slide? Uh, uh, just bouncing through the last of this really quickly. Also right, make sure that uh, the performance is gripping. Uh, finding the correct narrator is uh, incredibly important and key, which Ruby will touch on in just a moment. Uh -huh. My turn. Most of you have listen to the traditional audiobooks on cassette and tape where there's one narrator, little to no music or sound effects, and is very much like when you were a kid and your parent was reading to you. It's a lovely experience. I have many fond memories of my parents reading to me as a kid. However, everybody else is doing that. So you might want to consider other options. One of which, and this is my favorite story, so I will tell it again. October 30th, 1938. Orson Welles performed the radio play War of the Worlds and terrified half of his listeners. This is pretty darn impressive because this is a time period when radio was just starting to get out, but he created a new kind of story. He had sound effects. He had multiple voices. He created a production that convinced his listeners that aliens were taking over the earth. He made them transcend from the story and bring, he brought literally his audience into his story. I would like, and James and I would like to help you bring your stories to that same place where people are listening to your story and they can no longer tell that it's a narrator. They can just feel like they are part of it. All right, 
So Jane, oh, no, this is still me. Woohoo! Uh, I'm using this as an example. This is from Mickey McKinney, Boy Detective, which was one of my first um, audio productions. I'm just going to have you listen to it um, with just the audio so you can hear how it sounds. I think Charlotte remembers this from last year. Hang on. Let's see if I can. Okay, still a pretty fun story, but you I don't on... know that we could, could I, was we saying, hear I, that? I was not able to hear that. Oh, it's, shoot, it's, okay. Yeah, it's, um, it's, a yeah, share it's because of share screen. You have to share the audio uh, probably. Dang, so, damn it. <laughs> I was so you, thinking it was much quieter than 2018. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you, there's a little tiny button. There yeah. you go. There you go. There you go. That's no clothes bill. Hmm? <laughs> go ahead, Ruby. Get, okay. Hit it. Uh, let's see. Can you hear it now? Uh, no. Ow. Ah, bugger. Ah. <sighs> Probably James, <laughs> I'm I'm looking at it. Um, uh, I think you have to reshare the screen, and then there's a little tiny box to click the audio. You have um, to you have to kill your screen share and then do it again. Yeah, don't share the screen. Don't share the screen. So just leave it as it is. I don't know. I mean, if sure. if you have audio on a screen share, you need to click a little box. Uh, Ruby, all you have to do when you go to share your screen, before you mm -hmm. click on the screen that you're going to share, you're going to look at the bottom left hand corner of that share screen selection, and it's going to say share computer audio. Make sure that is ticked. Well, um, so you got to stop this share and start here. over. Stop yeah, sharing and start one. over. Yeah. <laughs> James, this is why I brought you on board, because I was pretty sure something like this would happen. <laughs> Okay, okay, give give me one moment. Um, well, okay. well, unshare and then reshare. So, okay. in the uh, Ruby, Wait, Ruby, yeah. Eddie, you, Eddie down, you could do it. No, no, I can, and I think I think I can, anyways. I think uh, you can unshare her and then reshare her. I don't know. I'm gonna try. Okay. Go up to the top, Eddie, and click the drop down, and it'll say "Stop participant sharing." Oh, uh, what, uh, what just happened? Under On the view options up on the top bar. View options. View up, right at the top. Up, up. Yeah, got it. There we go. Perfect. Yeah, but all right. So she stopped, but I got to give her the rights to share again, right? Ugh. She should maintain those rights as long as she sees the share screen button on that bottom bar. Yep, she can. OK, cool. Uh, all right, so Ruby, now if you click share screen. Okay. Great, it's nothing At wrong the with the bottom left is share audio. Zoom Sorry. thing you gotta hit. Oh, share computer sound? Share computer yeah, sound, yeah. exactly. Click that go. and now you're in business. <sighs> we gotta, oh, is this my personal password? Let's hope so, because I saw that I left. The name's McKinney, Mickey now? McKinney. Yep, we're good. Joe Namath Woo. is quoted saying, when you win, nothing hurts. 14, 23, hut, hut. Uh, what? Huh? Hey, Pipsqueak, you've got the ball. Oh, sorry. The name's McKinney, sorry. Mickey McKinney. Joe Namath is quoted saying, when you win, nothing hurts. 14, 23, hut, hut. Uh, what? Huh? Hey, Pipsqueak, you've got the ball. Get moving. Oh, okay. I take issue with this statement, as I feel that when you get tackled by half the guys on defense, winning still hurts a little. Okay, that's just without the sound effects. Uh, you do hear the other characters, but it still sounds pretty basic. What you would uh, it is normally. It's a very traditional audiobook format that we were discussing a moment ago. Yes, if you still remember that. <laughs> uh, now we're going to try it with the sound effects of Charlotte. I'm sure you re 
remember this and we're gonna see if it makes it a little more fun. The name's McKinney, Mickey McKinney. Joe Namath is quoted saying, when you win, nothing hurts. 14, 23, hut, hut! Yeah. Uh, what? Huh? Hey, you got the ball, get moving! <laughs> I take issue with this statement, as I feel that when you get tackled by half the guys on defense, winning still hurts a little. Alright, I, I love sharing that clip. It's so much fun. I absolutely love that story. However, this is sort of similar. I, I was warned not to compare myself to Orson Welles. I would never do that. However, it definitely is a lot more fun to listen to because now you're having a new experience. It's not just the traditional narrator telling the story. It's actually a full-on audio experience, and that is something we do a lot with Jack. Thank you for that, Jack, because it makes your story stand out. So let's say, for example, that you want to make your own book into an audiobook. First step is you have your manuscript. Um, if someone was giving it to me, um, I would have to convert it into an audiobook. Sometimes they want specific sound effects put in, so I have to make sure that that is added into the story as I go, uh, make sure that the specific sounds are heard. So I usually go through the whole things like, all right, so we've got cars here, and this is a busy street here, and we've got, oh shoot, there's a big shooting scene here. <laughs> that was a fun bit in Anarchy for sure. Um, just make sure you understand where the sound effects are, build a library, and that can be used for the editor later. Um, unless you decide that you want to do the narration yourself, you're probably going to have to find a narrator out there, which means talking to actors and finding people who are willing to do your story. I would very much like to emphasize the point of finding a good one and going through the audition process. It is very, very difficult, not only for yourself, but for whoever you hire, if you decide to hire someone and then they go through the whole entire book and you don't like their voice. Not only is it <laughs> frustrating for someone like James, who had this experience, it is going to be frustrating for you too because that's time wasted on their hands and that's money wasted on yours. James, if you want to talk about briefly, you definitely can. <laughs> uh, I don't think we need to pour too much salt on the wounds, but uh, yeah. yes, one of the one of the first audiobooks that Ruby ever hired me for, I went through the process of recording the entire thing and after the fact, the author and producer decided, uh, nah, never mind. And it it ended up being awkward yes i am still so so sorry for that so make you, sure you didn't go... do that please don't be sorry I, you're still my friend <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good thing to make uh, good friends while you're in this business and take care of your friends and that was i i still feel guilty about that um so, so... Can, I, can i butt in and say something here yeah, um, please do. Yeah, go for it. because because i've i've become an old pro at this after working with, with Ruby for so long, um, what I do is ask for two or three people uh -huh. to audition and I give them some, some script that I want them to read and, and uh, some specific directions about what the character is like, even down to the color of their eyes and their hair and the way that they stand or you know what, what mm -hmm. part of the country they're from, et cetera, et cetera. So I give them <clears throat> some guidance I give them a prepared script to recite and it's just a minute or two. And then I, I listen to two or three people and there might be one person who's really good, but not quite there. I ask them if they can fine tune this, you know, shape that up, you know, mm -hmm. be a little bit more like this or that. And I got my person. Yeah. And definitely love you for that, Jack, because you absolutely know how your character is supposed to sound. And that should be something you do when you make an audiobook. Know how your character is supposed to sound. It's very difficult to work with people who are kind of wishy-washy. It's like, well, I think they kind of sound like this. But if the author doesn't know how their character is supposed to sound, then how is the actor supposed to do it? So find out before you start the process. 
I would like to recommend some places where you can go if you do want to start searching. I have it right down at the bottom in very tiny letters, so you have to squint your eyes. We have acx.com, Pond5, Voice123, and Fiverr.com. ACX is probably going to be the most expensive place to find your actors. However, they're going to have a lot of options. Fiverr, definitely the least expensive. I know Jack has had some success in Fiverr, right, Jack? Because uh, that's yeah. where you got some of the voices for Wild Blue Yonder. Uh, yeah, we, we got that Italian guy from, um, from mm -hmm. New York, from Fiverr. Yeah. Yeah. Can, when you can I hire... ask? A... Hmm? Yeah, Is I was that... just curious. Yeah, I was just curious, and uh, I hate to ask this with the union guy sitting on the uh, other <laughs> end, but um, is there, does anyone sort of go to local theater groups or community, you know, where folks are doing that, or is it just not pan out, or is it oh, too no, keeping? I, I, I did uh, local theater. Um, uh, Lucas Guerrero and uh, Leanne Labra, who played the voices of Mickey McKinney and uh, Berners, they were both in my sister's theater class, so definitely local theater right there. Oh, um, right on. Right on. Cool. But the, the union guy that... wholeheartedly endorses that, by the way. <laughs> definitely <laughs> source cool. local talent. Downside right of that is they might not know how to use a mic, so we, we had to uh, take a little time to train him, and she's like five fingers away from the mic at all times. <laughs> Because we definitely yeah. had some stuff where they were clipping. So just take that into consideration. The same goes for uh, when you're finding someone who is a professional actor versus someone who is doesn't claim they're professional. Professional are probably going to be more expensive. Uh, they can charge a minimum of 50 an hour. That is actually a pretty decent rate. Non-professionals will definitely be cheaper, but you will have to consider why they are that cheap. Uh, are they a good actor? Are they going to give you the best audio quality that you can get for your story? Are they going to deliver it on time like they ask? And are they going to give you a product that you can share proudly or are you going to have to do it all again and that's just a waste of money and time on everyone's hands? So always compare rates beforehand. Be picky. It's okay. It's your story make sure that you are getting the best options for your book. And again, let me butt in here and say, um, we hired Jill Kofsky to do a voice for mm -hmm. um, Wild Blue Yonder for the re-recording of Wild Blue Yonder. And <clears throat> she wanted to see this script. This is all before we, I put any money down. She, she uh, read through the script and she calculated the number of what they call in audio finished hours. Okay, it's not the number of hours that she spent fiddling and diddling and horsing around and practicing. It's the number of hours that were perfect and ready to go into the recording. Okay, and so, uh, hang on. Yeah, she's a professional. Absolutely love Jill. I'm going to kill this phone. Um, Please do. You're ruining my talk, Jack. I can't believe it. <laughs> James, if you want to take it from there, um, since we've sort of covered voice acting, you can get on to the next bit. Sure. Uh, so speaking a little bit from the, the technical perspective, um, there are a thousand different ways that you can go about creating a workflow in order to produce an audiobook, And none of them are necessarily wrong. But if you're new to the process, the one thing I have to caution you against is just winging it. Because mm -hmm. that's almost the one golden rule that that will always be wrong. Uh, there are steps where it's like you might record and not realize that you missed a step early on that tanks you two or three steps down the line when you're trying to master the production and you realize only after having put in all of the supplemental time, money, and effort, oh, we have to go back and redo the whole thing. So first and foremost, I would recommend have your game plan when you start recording. And the easiest way to come up with a game plan is to know what are your deliverable specifications? <clears throat> excuse me, what are your deliverable specifications? Are you going to be posting this to YouTube, Audible? Is it going on your personal website? Where is it going to go and what requirements do they have? Um, next slide. We're gonna get into uh, specific deliverable. No, 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 next slide is fine. 
Uh, we're going to go into specific deliverable specifications in a minute, but just as a best practice thing, I want to go over recording issues that are very common that uh, we run into quite frequently. Um, rooms need some degree of soundproofing in order to get really crisp, clear audio. I mean, we're all on Zoom right now. You can probably tell that uh, the way that I sound or the way that anyone in the conference is sounding right now, probably not what you want to have jammed straight into your ears when you're listening to an audiobook. Uh, you want sound that's going, or you want to be in an environment where sound is going to be absorbed and diffused rather than reverberating and echoing throughout the room. Performer being too close to the microphone will kill you every time. You'll get those really strong plosive P and B and T sounds that are just unpleasant on the ears and will take the, uh, the audience member out of the experience. We all have a tendency to speak very fast in general conversation with one another because it's what we can do. But for an audiobook, that doesn't work. A narrator actually has to speak at quite a deliberate pace in order to make sure that the audience member has time to absorb what has been said before moving on to the next point that they need to absorb. Uh, one of the first rejections I ever got from uh, one of Ruby's clients was, he's reading too fast. And I'm like, this is just how I talk. It doesn't matter. That's not how, that's not how it works when it comes to doing audiobooks. Um, we're going to cover actual microphones in a minute and go into a little bit of the tech on that, but spending a little bit of money to ensure that you have quality, making sure that your equipment is well maintained, and even something as simple as making sure all the cables are plugged in correctly will save you so much time in the long run. An improperly connected cable can give you a hum or a buzz throughout your audio source that you're never going to be able to get rid of no matter what kind of sophisticated audio processing software you have. So in short, just due diligence, put time, put consideration into recording. The thing that tanks most people isn't some grandiose lack of knowledge, it's skipping over the basics. We are not going to delve too deep into the complicated, disgusting cesspit of a world that is using this piece of equipment versus that piece of equipment but I do wanna speak very briefly about microphone selection. Um, I very, very sincerely mean it when I say the right tool for the job is the one that is within your means. No one should ever break the bank and give away their rent money in order to come up with the money to make an audiobook. It doesn't need to be that complicated. It doesn't need to be that expensive. As a general rule of thumb, there are two types of microphones, very broadly speaking, that uh, are used in professional recording. The first is a general USB microphone, which plugs into your computer via the USB port. It's what I'm speaking on right now. Um, the second is what's called an XLR microphone, which is uh, a wider cable gauge. Most computers do not have a direct XLR input, which means that you have to go through a hardware interface. The benefit to using an XLR microphone is they usually have some degree of control over the microphone itself built in. So if you plug an XLR microphone into an audio interface and then into your computer, you can actually control the gains, the fades, the frequencies that are being recorded in order to exclude things that you don't necessarily want to hear and in order to emphasize things that you do want to hear, like the specific frequencies generated by the human voice. On a similar note, I will always recommend using a cardioid mic for audiobook presentation um, because they are designed in a manner that, like I was saying a moment ago, where you can go in and control fades, they by default focus on capturing the range of frequencies that the human voice makes while excluding other frequencies. It's very helpful for keeping things like the dog barking in the background or traffic on the street outside out of your presentation, even if you can't necessarily escape from an environment where those things are present. Sorry about that, by the way. <laughs> You're fine. Okay. I say, besides, we like dogs here. Yeah. Well. Um, without going into too many details about the thousands of mics that are out there, I do want to give you three broad recommendations. Um, one of the most commonly used studio microphones is the Newman U87 AI switchable studio mic. It's really expensive. It costs about $3,200 <laughs> on Amazon. Uh, and it's a great microphone. I've used it before. 
you will get very nice, crisp, clear audio out of it. There's a reason it is sort of the gold standard. However, if you don't have an extra three grand to lay down on a microphone, something like the Rode NT1A anniversary vocal mic is really very good. It only costs about $230. Um, I forgot that I actually wrote on the slide that I own two of them, but I do. I highly recommend them. Um, and the audio quality is not $3,000 less, if that makes any sense. There is a point of diminishing returns when it comes to putting money into the best microphone and the best software and the best computer and the best audio interface. You don't need the best. For something that is relatively low budget, if you're only spending a couple of hundred or a thousand dollars on a complete audio interface setup, you can make beautiful audiobooks. I know this because Ruby and I have done it. When we started out, we didn't have access to all the bells and whistles. And Jack, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Our clients were really happy with the products we were able to deliver them using this more low budget equipment. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, for someone who just wants the simplest interface, uh, I recommend the Blue Yeti microphone. Uh, Yeti has a ton of different options and you can get bogged down in the Blue Yeti Pro or the Blue Yeti Plus or the Blue Yeti Sonic and don't worry about any of that. I'm currently speaking to you on a Blue Yeti standard microphone. You can pick it up at Best Buy for 130 bucks. Um, mine actually came with a video game for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that technically means for the value of both of them, I got it for 60 bucks. And um, it's a really high quality microphone. Uh, if you just want to use a direct USB interface and you don't want to worry about learning all of that extra crap, for lack of a better word. So finding an editor. Um, when it comes to doing uh, sound work in general, but audiobooks in particular, your editor is going to be both a creative and a technician. Uh, and if you can't find someone who meets both criteria, you're going to need to find multiple people because it's really difficult to try to do any of the audio engineering aspects of audiobook production with no frame of reference for the technical side. Um, finding an editor who understands ACX requirements proper sound mixing and has a creative ear is going to save you time and money in the long run. Uh, you can learn how to do all of that yourself. All of the information is available almost for free on YouTube. Uh, Lynda.com and Skillshare are both beautiful places where you can learn to do all of the creative and technical aspects of production uh, for low cost subscriptions. But if you are interested in hiring someone, if you're not interested in doing the process yourself, there are plenty of groups on social media where you can find very talented editors at affordable rates. Um, I Need an Editor is a Facebook group dedicated to post-production service people. You can find people at just about every price point you can imagine in there, as long as you're not charging below minimum wage. Um, uh, podcast Sound Group, on Facebook is another group where I highly recommend finding people. I've worked with several people out of there, incredibly talented, an incredibly good pool. Yes, you're occasionally gonna run into, for lack of a better term, some jackass who isn't very good at their job, but the groups are actually very good at self-policing and kicking those people out after they've received uh, a warning from a client who says, this person soured my experience with this group, please, take that under consideration. And that's all I've got on that. ACX requirements. I believe I heard Charlotte talking a little bit about ACX before this panel started. Um, for those of you who don't know, the ACX quality assurance standards are used to determine whether an audio production meets the technical requirements for distribution. Overall, they are not stringent requirements. Uh, Audio has to be consistent in sound and formatting. That's pretty basic. Must be free of extraneous sounds like the dog and the car in the background. Have to have opening and closing credits. All files have to be in the same format. These are all pretty basic things to deal with. The things where it gets a little bit technical are 
the output requirements, things like measuring your audio at between negative 23 and negative 18 decibels RMS and having negative three peak values and having a noise floor of no greater than negative 60. What does any of that mean? Essentially, it just means that your audio has to average at a certain volume. They don't want to distribute an audiobook that's going to be too loud or too quiet. So all of the sound has to be confined within a certain range, which they've outlined here. Um, Negative three peak value simply means that you don't want your audio to ever exceed negative three decibels. You don't want to hurt people's ears with your production. If you write the next great American novel or British novel or wherever you're coming from, I don't care. Uh, novels come from all over the place and they're all wonderful. Um, if you blow out the audience's ears while they're listening to it, you're not going to make any money off of them. People are going to return the product. People are going to ask for their money back and you're going to be left with not just nothing, but a damaged reputation, uh, which is why they're very big on ensuring that everything falls in within these standards. In terms of the output file at the very bottom, this is almost a non-consideration to have an MP3 file of 192 kilobits at 44,100 hertz, because almost all audio equipment records at a higher standard than that today. These requirements were set in the early 90s We've exceeded them. The most basic computers that you can pick up at Target or Best Buy now have more powerful audio output capabilities. So this is almost something where no matter what you do, you're going to be recording at a higher quality and have to dumb your product down for distribution. That makes things very, very easy. This is one of the more complicated aspects of the presentation. So before we jump ahead, does anyone have any questions on the technical aspects that I've gone over so far? Because I don't want that to get left behind. Um, not technical per se, but <clears throat> this, this is also the place where you've got to get some um, auditions and have people give you some stuff to listen to, not only for um, the appropriateness of their voice acting, but also to have Ruby run it through her computer and make sure that that they're within the specs and that there's not a bunch of noise in the background and stuff like that, which you've just got through mentioning. Um, and stuff that you don't hear, stuff, stuff that you as the author may not hear at all, but are, are still there. So. That is a terrific point. Um, if, if you can't be there in person when people are recording, if you're not the one who is setting up the audio interface for them or someone from your team is not setting up the audio interface, then you need to essentially audition their equipment as well as their performance. Um, on that note, I actually thank you for bringing that up, Jack, because that reminds me. General recommendation, when it comes to any part of audiobook production, do not wear noise cancel headphones. <laughs> the filters that noise cancel headphones put through uh, or go through in order to deliver the cleanest signal to your ear alters the audio signal to take out what are considered bad parts. It's very helpful when you're actually listening to something that's already been mastered and distributed. When you're just trying to figure out what is it that I've recorded in the first place, you don't want to lose in any of that information. You want to, with non-processed sound monitoring, be able to tell, yes, I have the cleanest signal possible, or, oh, there's this problem that we need to address. Let's take care of that now. Question, is that what our, my, my live streaming thing says disable audio processing is that what that would be referring? i'm sorry can you say that again my live streaming uh platform it asked me if i want to disable audio processing before i record or before i go live is that what they partially yeah. yes um that is a similar process and since you're doing it as a direct live stream, you actually would like that post-processing on there because that ensures that the signal being sent out for distribution is the cleanest one possible. Right. But simply for the purposes of recording where you intend to do a post-production process, you don't want to filter any of that out okay. because you want to go through the process of cleaning it up yourself. Yeah, okay. Are you going to be covering the cost to do all of this? 
Uh, that's something we were going to be talking about mostly based on your requirements. We didn't want to throw out a bunch of arbitrary numbers and talk about, well, if you have this, you could do this, or if you have this, I'd actually prefer to take your questions on how it pertains to you rather than give. Just, just, just say an average eight hour book that's straight fiction. Just, you know, it, there are some guidelines I've seen. Just was wondering what you might think. So in eight, eight hour, eight hours being finished product. Okay. So for something like that, we generally measure it as for every minute of recorded audio, or I'm sorry, for every minute of finished audio, you're going to have between five and 10 minutes of recorded audio, mm -hmm. secondary takes, mess ups, goofs, things like that. That's all something that has to be taken into account for how much you're paying the vocal performer. Based on the amount of editorial material that you have, an editor can go through that only so fast. The general rule of thumb for that is an editor can usually, if you're only doing audio, if you're not worrying about any video components whatsoever, an editor can usually complete between 20 and 30 minutes of editorial work a day. Um, so taking that into account, your editor would say need 16 days for eight hours. And then your performer would mean, sorry, need to do the math on my phone. Not that good. <laughs> uh, speaking from personal experience while you're doing that, usually if I have um, a finished product of 15 minutes, that's going to take me about four hours. So they'll hand me something. It's probably about an hour when it starts. I cut through the whole thing. It ends up being about 15 minutes. That's a four hour process right there. Uh, Jack's books in particular, he hands me a chapter, that's a good four hour section right there that I'm editing for that chapter. So 32 chapters, uh, that's 120 hours right there. Yeah. It might for... be a little slower than others, but it, it really depends on who you hire for that. Based on the math that I just crunched, an eight hour production probably comes out to a grand total of 26 working days. And the cost of that will be associated with how much you're paying the voice actor and how much you're paying the editor. Um, and other considerations can of course increase that, like if you're using multiple narrators coordinating with the different teams and things like that. Sound effects, was that include sound effects or is that plus, yep. a plus? But that would fall under editorial. So yes, that would include sound effects. So do you have a number for that sort of range for that 26 out or 26 days, whatever that was? Uh, generally speaking, if you're working at a minimum wage rate, which we always just calculate that out as $15 an hour, because that's what we think the minimum should be. Um, that comes out to $3,120 just on labor. And then the voiceover is, is plus, right? The voice actor. Oh, no, that should be in there. No, that that's included in that. That's included. Okay. Yeah. Um, the one thing that you should be aware of is if you are working through services like ACX or you're doing anything with uh, union people, or if you're doing people who have an established following already, you may have to work in a deal with them that involves residuals. Um, that is something that I can't give you a full standard on because there are a thousand different ways to negotiate it, but vocal performers taking anywhere between uh, five to 15% of residuals on an audio production, not uncommon, not unheard of. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. And sorry, did I answer all of your question there? I feel like I may have missed something. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. You're very welcome. Uh, keep uh, going then if everyone's good. All right. I think so. Right. Speaker forever, hold your peace. <laughs> Here we go. To ah, you. Shoot. That's me. All right, well, <laughs> I, so, uh, so you went through the process, so you took your book, you found out the important key points, you found a narrator who sounded exactly the way you wanted them to in your head, and also out loud, so the voices in your head matched the voices of the actor, fantastic, they uh, narrated the whole thing for you, it's recorded, it's beautiful, you've passed it on to the editor, they've cut it together. Now you've got the project that has been exported out at the specifications of ACX. You are now ready to publish. 
However, once again, <laughs> this is still only 5% of your success. You still have that 95% that includes marketing in order to get your story out there so people can see it. And this is you, James. <laughs> um, when it comes to that 95% marketing threshold, and I, I think I wrote this later on in the slideshow, but I think it's worth acknowledging up front. Um, you are already a creative if you've written a book. If you are an author, you are already a creative working in a creative field. The creativity of marketing is just as important as the creativity of the writing itself. There are hundreds of thousands of ways that you can go about trying to get your story or your publication or your audiobook in front of people. Entering your book or your audiobook or even just associated materials or unrelated materials into competitions in order to grow your brand and credibility as an author is huge. If you can submit a story to a short story competition or a full length novel competition and you win and they invite you down on stage and say, so what else have you got in the pipeline? You can plug something else that you're working on, which might be your primary product. Uh, some of the first times that I ever got any of my passion projects in front of people, it was because I worked on things that I didn't feel as confident about, I didn't care about as much. But when I finished those and people, res it, they resonated with people, when someone would ask me, well, what else do you have in the pipeline? That's when I could talk about the projects that I really loved. That's when I could talk about the things that I really cared about. And that helped me share those things with a wider audience. Making sure your content is available to people who might be interested to prospective audience members is incredibly important. Post sample chapters of your text and the audiobook on your website or on different review sites, or maybe even on YouTube. Ask the people in your social circle to read your book or listen to the audiobook and post reviews on the places that you're selling it. If you're self-published on Amazon, more reviews are only going to translate into a better placing in, in Amazon's search algorithm. Promote your work on social media. Send free copies of your work to YouTubers or social media influencers who are known for reviewing content like yours and ask them if they can give you a shout out. The worst thing that can ever happen if you do that is that they say no. Um, and one of the most important things is if you are working with a team, if you have an editor, if you have multiple voice actors, if you have an engineer, everyone is interested in expanding their own credibility and their own resume. Everyone has a vested interest in your work becoming a success. So everyone's gonna try to get it out there. They're gonna post it to their social media profiles. They're going to post it to their different networks. In, in essence, for every person you bring onto the team, you gain a whole new network of contacts who are going to help you get it out there because it's no longer about your story, it's about your collaborative project and how to share that with the world. Oh, there you go. And remember, <laughs> money absolutely talks. I feel dirty even saying this, because I don't like encouraging people to spend money. I don't believe that the arts should be dependent on money. But unfortunately at this time, they are. The United States spends about $163 billion on advertising every single year because it works. Mm -hmm. Avengers Endgame was able to cross the $2 billion threshold because Disney spent $400 million advertising it. It worked. Every social media platform you can think of has a service that will allow you to give them your money so that they can put your stuff in front of people outside of your friends and your contacts list and your individual network. You don't have to have a lot of money to get started up front. If you have even a small investment, it can yield a return that will allow you to keep going if you do it strategically. Most of these services have ways of targeting specific individuals, whether it be based on hashtags or whether it be based on trending content or whether it just be based on content that is similar to yours. If you can spend just a couple of hundred dollars getting your stuff in front of a small audience, that will help you grow a bigger one. This is only tangentially related, but I was working on a, uh, with a YouTuber last year who uh, posted a video on uh, her channel 
and used a service called Sprizzy. Sprizzy essentially allows you to get your content in front of other people by uh, showing them, showing people who are already looking at stuff similar to your content, your stuff in the form of advertisements. She put $150 into a Sprizzy campaign. Her channel was typically averaging about a thousand views per video. Uh, the Sprizzy campaign brought her up to 5,000, which was great. But that triggered the YouTube algorithm and made it take note of her. And suddenly all of her videos were getting more views and more advertising revenue. Suddenly that video that she only paid to get 5,000 additional views on has over 750,000 views today. Learning how to game social media algorithms is going to be one of the most important things in achieving that 95% marketing ratio that Ruby and I were talking about earlier. I already started to say this, but your creativity can talk more than your money can in some cases. You produced a book and an audio book. Now use it to generate more marketing material. Human beings are visual oriented creatures. Poster art and video trailers can hook onto an audience and resonate with people who aren't inclined to read books, which is most people right now. If you can show them something that makes them think I might wanna listen to that, that's the most powerful tool that you have. A trailer can go a thousand different ways, like everything else I'm saying. That should just be the theme of the event, a thousand different ways. Trailers can be as simple as excerpts of the audiobook with still images playing over it, or you can go nuts and do a full Hollywood production. Uh, I actually worked on a book trailer uh, last year that um, they sank, I think, about $200,000 into making that trailer. And now the book that was associated with it, uh, Peace Talks of the Dresden Files, is already a New York Times bestselling uh, novel after having only been on the market for about two months now. Uh, it depends on what you can put into it. Obviously, everyone has different means. It's not a matter of being able to put the most money into it. It's a matter of being able to put something into it and doing it strategically. And rather than try to just go off on random strategies about that, when it comes time for the Q&A in just a few minutes, I'll take specific questions about your specific situation so I'm not boring you with vague hypotheticals. Do we have any questions from people? Well, I, I have another comment, if I can jump in here. Um, Please do. Um, <clears throat> when uh, the first project that James and I worked on when, we brought, when Ruby and I brought James in was a novella and mm. we used multiple voices and that was you know six or seven years ago and that, now it's it's becoming pretty common to if you go to uh, Audible you'll see that quite a few books now have at least two or three different people reading the character it's not just a single voice reading the entire thing so um, I wanted to make that comment. Then also, um, I, I think I had my, my mic muted before, but I was starting to talk about Jill Kofsky, who's an IPA member. Um, we brought her in to read for uh, this new version of Wild Blue Yonder that we've been working on forever and ever. It's such a huge cast and so much detail to it, but it's going to be an incredible book when it comes out early next year. But when I gave Jill the the highlighted script that she would be reading. She did a word count, it was 1,726 words. And she said, uh, based on her rates, the cost to do that would be $275. Then she gave me a 10% discount because we're both IPME members. And then because Ruby was going to be doing the editing, she gave me another discount because Aww. she has an editor that she uses. So I ended up paying, uh, paying uh, Jill $207 to do what's well, probably about what, 15 minutes. Jack, I think we lost you again. Yeah. Oh, we did? Yeah. Uh, you're back. Don't move around so much. Yeah, or, you, or you're entering a hurricane, Jack. Oh, yeah. I was moving the, the computer over so I could read off the other no. screen. Don't, uh, don't do that. So, um, so Jill, uh, the, the final total for about 15, 17 minutes of recording of, um, of what we call the, uh, the finished recording 
was two hundred and seven dollars. So this is this has turned into a big deal. This uh, Wild Blue Yonder re redo because we've got I don't know we have a, probably ten or twelve voice people. actors. How many? Fifteen. Fifteen. Believe me, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in charge of all of them. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> We got Irish accents, Italian accents, mm -hmm. um, southern, you know, southern U.S. accents, and yeah. um, it's it's just going to be a real barrel of, barrel of fun when when it's finally done to just to sit back and listen to it. But I'm only half of that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, I think that this is the this is the way of of audiobooks in the future that they're going to take on the same kind of model as movies do with multiple characters, multiple voices, music in the background, sound effects, mm -hmm. all that stuff. That's actually something Ruby and I were talking about yesterday when we were prepping for this. Um, more and more, I think you're gonna start to see audiobooks are becoming more cinematic. I think mm -hmm. yeah. you're gonna start to see that movies are the big thing, video games are the big thing, and audiobooks are gonna do their darndest to try to make themselves as much like those other formats as they possibly can, just so that they can compete with them. Oh yes, yeah, so jump on the bandwagon early, guys. <laughs> Don't wait. You know, Audible's running these ads on TV. You've probably mm -hmm. seen where they, you know, they show people getting up in the morning and commuting to nowhere and coming home, and mm -hmm. they're only going out so they can listen to Audible. Um, <laughs> but but the whole thing about being cinematic, I think it's really true that that you know it's a lot easier to listen to something when you're driving and to watch a movie I and mean, you can't really watch a movie, although I've seen people watching videos while they're driving. But, yeah. Um, Don't do that. You won't encourage that. <laughs> audio is a different experience than, than watching something or reading something. Um, so if you can immerse people in it, you know, so much the better. Which I believe uh, brings us on to our next point. We wanted to talk a little bit about book trailers because you can put a post out there and basically say, hey, I've got a new book out. Unfortunately, there are about 60,000 other people who are also getting their book out at the same time, so you might get lost. If you have a book trailer, you will probably make more of an impression. As James said, people are visual uh, creatures. They are going to look at the movement more than they are going to see the picture and the description underneath. That's, to be frank, that's a little boring. Showing a visual is a lot more exciting. Actually, James, why don't you take the rest of the since it's your slide? <laughs> I mean, I think you were doing a great job. Oh, well, um, thank you. Keep going. I, I've said a lot of what I wanted to say on this subject already. A lot of what I still have to say is just on the slide. Um, leave your audience wanting more. Most ads can be skipped after about five seconds and every second that passes is an opportunity for them to walk away. I cannot tell you how many writers, actors, and different performers I have run into who have said, oh, my work is amazing. My work is amazing. They'll stay for my, no, they won't. They, they don't care. The audience just is not that forgiving or that generous. Try to get in and get out as quickly as you can. Uh, the trailer should establish the story, the genre, and where they can access your product. I can't tell you how many trailers I see that look amazing and then nowhere in the trailer or the description do you find a place where you can go buy the product that is being advertised. Uh, that doesn't do anyone any good. At that point, all you've done is waste the money that you've put into producing this trailer. And um, like with everything else, be interesting. This is one of your few shots to communicate your art visually. Take advantage of the format. If you know a painter or you know someone who can make really incredible photography or digital Photoshop art or someone who is an incredible cinematographer, take advantage of those things. If you have any of those skills, put them to use, please. The fact that you're an amazing author is only going to get you part way when it comes to getting your work published. I'm, I'm so glad that you talked about book trailers. Uh, back when I was involved in putting conferences together for Ripley, uh, we tried two or three times to have a session on book trailers. Mm -hmm. And I, over the years, I've been making a collection of book trailers that are, are uh, strong, both Definitely. good and bad, and looking at the different elements in them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether the, the, the sometimes the illustrator talking about why he did what he did uh, was wonderful. 
But again, my a pet peeve of mine is children's books that look like the book itself will be alive. And and when in fact, you know, it 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 basically is saying there is a book out there, but it is not giving the experience of what reading the book would be. So do you have some particulars about which of all these elements now that are possible, uh, how how to match up the 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 cast of sounds and sights to a particular book? Uh, this is this is going to sound pretty basic, but uh, a book trailer that I worked on once uh, had a director who just he was an auteur. He thought that he was the next Spielberg or whatever. And so he took it upon himself to rewrite all of the dialogue that went into the book for the trailer. He's like, that might work in a book, but it doesn't work at all in, mm. uh, in a trailer. And he was wrong. Um, you don't want to false advertise. I would say one of the biggest things is if you're going to be working on a book trailer, you want that to be as direct an adaptation of the source material as you can possibly make it. Don't take liberties with your own um, content by making it seem like something it isn't. Being honest is probably the most important thing that you can do when it comes to advertising your product. In terms of the specific visual elements and whatnot, uh, no, that's gonna come down mostly to what you have access to, what talents you have available and what the creatives involved with the production of the trailer itself uh, bring to the table. Uh, I've said it I don't know how many times and I'm probably going to say it a few more but there are a thousand different ways to do it correctly uh, you can do something uh, like James said you can do a big old Holly production and just completely blow the bank on your production or you could do something a little more simpler I have a couple author friends who actually enlist uh, friends and family she's uh one in particular, she does a lot of romance novels. Her son is on the cover of every single book. He is in every single trailer. He is basically her lead romantic guy <laughs> in every single story. You don't have to do it exactly that way, but that is something you can consider. You can also just sit yourself in a chair, have your book out and say, hi, I am this author. I have written this book. You can shoot it all on your phone. I think you should read this story because it involves this fantastic adventure where you go off to the land of unicorns and you get to ride on rainbows. I'm sure none of you have stories like that, but you get the general idea. It can be very simple. It can be extravagant. The point is to share your craft, show what's great about your story in as little time as possible. Um, so really quick before you hit play on this and I-, I Will do. Yeah. Um, one thing that is just tragically true about the state of the world right now is that famous people are still probably the best way of advertising anything. If you can find a social media influencer or a DCB list celebrity or someone who already has a following or an attraction of their own to be in your trailer, um, you bring their network and their influencers or their influential circle uh, to your production and their fans can funnel to you and become your fans. So that is one annoying element that I will say is helpful, albeit not always the easiest thing to accomplish. But if you know anyone who happens to know one celebrity who retired to their town, just bark up that tree until someone either gives you a hard no or until someone breaks and says yes. Either way. Um, I've but that must, that show... must be really busy in California and in LA. Yeah. A bunch of people oh, yeah. barking up those trees. Oh yeah, you you spend more time deciding which celebrity to annoy than actually annoying one of them. Right. Hey, could I could I ask a production question before I forget? Of course. When when you were talking about editing, um, and then I heard you say, you know, what that what that time pans out to be on average, I was wondering, are there like general rules the best way? Do you have actors read through their mistakes and keep going and find it's less costly to go back to the broken and then redo or stop and go or I can field that one yeah um, 
it, it's good to get a clean cut, so it's fine if they read through a sentence and they mess up. That happens all the time. I, if they mess up in the beginning of a sentence, though, they should usually read through the whole thing again. Because while I can cut away the mistakes, it's very difficult if they mess up on a word and then they just keep going from there. And that's the only take I get because I can't fix that. So um, hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Whenever the actors make a mistake, I just ask that they read over that portion again. Uh, one of the first, the first book I did with Jack, actually, remember uh, the actor pronounced uh, Cambridge wrong. Oh yeah, Cambridge. And he, <laughs> and he decided that the way he was going to fix it was just say uh, Cambridge multiple ways with different tones in order to fix it. That did not fix it because now the narration sounded like he walked along the street of Cambridge. <laughs> and it did not sound right. So I had him go through the whole thing again and just read off that full sentence and then it fit properly. It, well, it sounded more natural for sure. So... Um, did that help at all? Or was I just talking for 10 seconds? That was a good example. OK, fantastic. Sorry. No, that was helpful. You're sort of just sort of uh, directing as you go. So if you hear a thing that, yes. that is should be stopped, you're stopping it. If it's the thing you might come back to, you're just letting it rip. I, I give them advice to do ahead of time. Um, so just general guidelines, and one of which is if you make a mistake, read back over that sentence again and that saves me a lot of heartache later right now. otherwise i gotta call him up and say hey you missed this sentence and this sentence i need to read it over and that just takes extra time so gotcha. give him gotcha. some general right guidelines now. ahead how much of that are you supposed to put up with i mean i put I guess, up with a lot <laughs> i guess you i guess you uh, you assess what their proficiency is before you hire them but yeah. Well, yeah, but the thing about it is, is there's there's this thing about inflection, and so a lot of times the the voiceover actor uh, tries two or three different takes on the recording, uh, giving us different inflections of what he or she thinks. Mm -hmm. Trying to say like, I thought you were going to go here. I thought you were going to go here. Mm -hmm. I can't believe you didn't go here. You know that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> and Ruby has to pick the one that. How much an hour, Jack? Oh my God! Yeah, she's. <laughs> I would pay for that voice. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> right. Yeah. Forget Ruby and James. We'll hire it's you. a very. You guys, it's a very I iterative <laughs> process. Very iterative because I have to give them a, a manuscript with all the, the appropriate dialogue highlighted. Yep. Ruby's got to work off that manuscript. She's got to listen to the recording, et cetera. So I think I think we're getting um, interrupted here. Are we interrupted? Nope. We're good. I just figured we should move on to the questions. Okay. <laughs> All right. We don't need to see the trailer. Yeah, we have to we have to break. Actually, it's five o'clock already. Well, yeah. if you ask a few questions and then and then okay. we'll break. I, I'm not going to need much time at the end. So okay. Go ahead. We can run I have a little a, late. I have a quote for you. I put it in the chat. I saw that. That that I'm stealing that. If you can, definitely, but just attribute it to Glenn Koenig somewhere because he's my like. If you don't have video, you don't audio. You don't have video. <laughs> yeah, that's that's definitely so, getting stolen. Thank you. Good, good, good. So, does anybody anybody uh, have questions for for Ruby and Jack? I have a comment, which was about your 5% for the sort of creative and 95% for the marketing. That's what a lot of people say about books themselves. Yeah. And um, some, of the, right. some of the biggest book marketers out there will tell you that writing your book is only 5% of the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's depressingly true, which is sounds so sad, but yeah. Well, it's one of, it's, it's very exciting, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, of, one of the things that actually makes it a little more palatable for me personally is um, your audiobook is, for all intents and purposes, uh, another version of the book, but it is also a piece of marketing material, which means it satisfies a little bit of both. So when it, I mean, just for me personally, I try to look for the creatives. I try to look for 
the parts of that 95% where I'm like, I've already done the work in the other 5% and I can reapply it. Or I can find ways of continuing to be creative in that 95% because marketing and advertising is just such a slog and it makes you feel so dirty at times. (laughs) Finding the ways to make it creative and enjoyable is something you need to do so that you don't give up halfway through the process. Well, there's a guy, there's a guy who would disagree with your view that, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what you should feel, but his view of mar- marketing these types of things is all you're doing is sharing your story. So he says, look at marketing and selling that way. And it's a lot easier to, to do it because, you know, Hey, I, I created this great audiobook. Would you like, to, you know, it's not, you don't have to be what they call like a used car salesperson, sleazy, pushy, (laughs) obnoxious, aggressive. Um, I mean, there's 30 adjectives that are all bad, you know? Um, Yeah. um, Uh, But you're right. That's actually a much better way of looking at it than my sort of, oh, I feel dirty. Please give me money. Oh, God. (laughs) Well, guys, I I do want to cut this off for now. Um, Thank you both for coming on and talking about audiobooks i'm sure there's so much more oh uh, yes maybe uh, you guys we can close um i just forgot we have one oh come on don't fail me now one more slide uh here's our contact information if you have any more questions we are happy to talk to you more after this conference well at our convenience i can't promise i'll be up at two in the morning to answer your questions but i will get to them at some point and james will as well <laughs> Yeah, I, I wish we had more time for questions. So please feel free to forward any other questions to us and we will happy to be happy to field them online. Will you guys uh, consider uh, appearance on the Facebook TV episode about this Absolutely. topic? Maybe we could think up a good angle to take. Maybe, maybe even book trailers. Mm-hmm. Thinking might be a good one. <laughs> maybe even book trailers. Yeah. Oh. We could do mine on the on the air. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, all right, guys. Thank thank you. Um, I do, I do know that John is waiting to to talk about uh, some some grants and funding and, and different things for IP and E. So I I think we need to to move along. Of course. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was great.